Hello there and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today for the last of our series of book talks in the year 2020 to 21. I'm Erica Berman, Director of the Ira F. Brilliant Centre for Beethoven Studies, and I'm delighted to be here today with Professor William Kinderman. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Bill. Um, William Thanks Kinderman. Hi, welcome. Um, joining us from California, so we're in the same time zone. Um, William Kinderman is Professor of Music and the Leo M. Klein and Elaine Crown Klein Chair in Performance Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's a scholar and pianist, and his many books include Beethoven, the biography of 1995, which I'm sure many people here will have read, um, The Creative Process in Music from Mozart to Kurtag and Wagner's Parsifal. And we are here today to talk about his latest book, which is Beethoven, A Political Artist in Revolutionary Times, published uh, last year for the anniversary year by University of Chicago Press. Um, the book explores the important role of Beethoven's politics and his art and talks about the composer's belief in the ideals of freedom and progress and how these shaped his music. There is a playlist which accompanies the book that includes uh, recordings that uh, are made by Bill himself, including the several works that are discussed in the book. I'm just dropping this in the chat now so that you can follow that. And I think we're going to hear some of these um, today as well, which is wonderful. So, Bill, thank you very much for being here to talk about your book. I'm just going to start straight off by asking you about Beethoven as a political artist, as in the title of your book. Um, can you tell us why is it important to think about Beethoven's politics when we appreciate his music? It seems to me that Beethoven's significance and impact, um, despite the a um, couple of centuries that have passed since his own lifetime has increased in recent decades. And I've asked myself, why should this be? And it has occurred to me that there's a parallel between the turbulent times he lived through um, with events like the outbreak of the French Revolution in nearby France, close to Bonn on the Rhine, where he grew up, um, the reign of terror in the 1790s that ensued, the um, situation um, in Austria uh, during his period of residence there, starting in 1792, when the uh, Habsburg monarchy became a highly reactionary state, the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Congress of Vienna and the reactionary turn of the government under Metternich, all of these uh, in a certain uh, sense can, might be compared to the ups and downs of the political history that we've known in decades since 1989 with the collapse uh, in that period of the Soviet empire and the expression uh, sometimes um, uh, prevalent at the beginning of the 1990s, thinking that we were entering a new age of expanded democracy. The setbacks that we've uh, experienced since then, including in this country in very recent years, uh, th this kind of polarization um, is not unlike what Beethoven went through. And uh, to remind us of that, you only need to reflect on the fact that um, growing up in the politically progressive Rhineland, and we could uh, discuss some of the key figures in, in due course, Beethoven found himself in Vienna in a state that was opposed to the conditions in revolutionary France, above all for the following reason, that Marie Antoinette was none other than the aunt of Kaiser Franz, the emperor in Austria during Beethoven's entire time there. And it became a high priority of, of Kaiser Franz to avoid any liberalization or move toward democracy, lest it lead to revolution. And um, Beethoven himself in certain sources from the mid 1790s um, implies 
um, and reveals how concerned he was about conditions there. Um, and yet, at the same time, was drawn strongly to events in France, his uh, attraction toward Napoleon Bonaparte as first consul as part of this, his attraction and adopt, uh, adoption of a French liberation theme for his opera Fidelio is another. And uh, so this entire configuration made me feel that the political dimension of Beethoven's uh, art has often been underestimated in favor of a viewpoint that he was a great, a so-called absolute musician um, and unconcerned about social and political events. Thank you. And you mentioned some of the key figures and um, particularly from his upbringing in this enlightenment hotspot of Bonn. Um, a figure that recurs at several points in your book is Friedrich Schiller. Could you talk to us a bit about Schiller and his importance in Beethoven's uh, political outlook? I think Schiller is a very key figure, um, known, of course, widely because Beethoven used Schiller's um, um, An die Freude or To Joy, the Ode to Joy, as the basis for the text of his Ninth Symphony, finished in 1824. But Schiller's uh, poem dates back to the mid 1780s before the French Revolution. And it's at this point that Beethoven and his friends and Bonn were strongly attracted to various works of Schiller, especially to Schiller's very political play, Don Carlos, which was something like required reading in the uh, circle of the reading society uh, that was so important to the young Beethoven. And then uh, we have learned since, um, even in more detail in recent years, that an important contact for Beethoven, probably dating back to his um, travel to Austria and back in 1787, was Andreas Streicher. Uh, and Andreas Streicher uh, and his wife, Nanette, were very close friends of Beethoven in Vienna in later years. They also, they were piano makers, also had a concert hall. Um, but Streicher happens to have been one of the key figures in Schiller's youth. And after Schiller's uh, kind of um, uh, controversial play, The Robbers, Die Räuber, um, Schiller was under house arrest and with Stryker escaped, leading to Schiller's move later on to Jena and then to Weimar, where Schiller had the famous collaboration with Goethe. Uh, but Stryker uh, was then one of these uh, figures, a musician himself, who was closely connected to Beethoven and closely connected to Schiller as well, reminding us that not only was there an intellectual and poetic affinity, but there, were, there was a personal network. Um, um, and Schiller remained uh, significant for Beethoven in many ways. For example, his play on Joan of Arc um, clearly had impact on the various versions of Beethoven's very political opera, Fidelio. Um, and the fact that um, most of Schiller's plays were uh, blocked from performances on the stage during a big chunk of time um, that, that Beethoven spent in Vienna probably only increased the attractiveness of these texts because one had access to the texts and occasionally to the performances when, when, when they were allowed, like the, the Joan of Arc play was produced in Vienna in 1802. Beethoven knew the, uh, the play in and out. He wrote canons on the text at the end. If one asked Beethoven in the street why he carried um, packets of music paper with him to make sketches, Beethoven was prone to reply, I dare not come without my banner which is quoting 
a, a line from the very end of Schiller's play where Joan of Arc, through her conviction to higher causes, is um, saying, well, her version of artist long life is short. Even if I perish, the principle of freedom and liberation for which I stand is primary. And this is the very same thing that Beethoven's uh, imprisoned freedom fighter Florestan uh, stands for, or the Count Egmont um, uh, in the Egmont music that Beethoven uh, wrote in around 1810 stood for. It's, it's a through line and uh, the um, aspects of this can be sensed in his instrumental works as well as the works with text. Could we talk a little more about his Bonn influences? Um, there are other figures that you mentioned. One is Eulogius Schneider, perhaps a less familiar figure uh, in Beethoven scholarship. Could you tell us a little about Schneider? I'd be glad to. And actually my uh, good assistant, Sam Young, might be able to show us a few illustrations because I suspect that for some of our audience, Eulogius Schneider be, might be a relatively unfamiliar figure. But from the research that I've done, uh, I think he's an absolutely key figure. Eulogia Schneider um, imbibed the principles of the French Revolution deeply. And in his career, moving from place to place, he um, made it his uh, task to promote the, uh, the principles of liberty and equality, etc in a very forthright way. And this brought him into collision with authorities, most particularly in Bonn, when Beethoven inscribed uh, at the University of Bonn and Schiller and Schneider rather, had just been appointed as professor of aesthetics there uh, around 1789, uh, the year of revolution. So if we, the, here we see Schneider, let's turn to the very next image of Schneider. And uh, you'll see the execution of Schneider on the guillotine at Paris. And this is in the period of Robespierre around 1794. And so the story here is pretty uh, vivid. In other words, Schneider was a, uh, undoubtedly a key figure for Beethoven. Uh, the, uh, evidence for this is, for instance, that the most important single work that the youthful Beethoven wrote there was his cantata on the death of Joseph II, the enlightened emperor um, and brother of the elector at Bonn. And um, Schneider, meanwhile, had written a poem on the same topic and there is good evidence that some of the text for Beethoven's cantata was also impacted by Schneider as well. And we know also that it was Schneider that put forth uh, in the Reading Society at Bonn the suggestion that they commissioned this young composer to, to set this text. Well, Schneider um, showed other convictions that were in line with Beethoven's lifelong proclivities. One is that he was, although he had been raised in the, uh, the Catholic faith, actually uh, he turned against it, felt that um, Catholicism was, was far too dogmatic and it, it was um, uh, wrong in its attitude toward nature. And so Beethoven's nature worship and his um, making fun of priests and his disinclination to go to religious, conventional religious services are all completely in line with Orlogius Schneider. Uh, but the clerics at nearby Cologne opposed Schneider vigorously. And, and finally, enough pressure was exerted on Orlogius Schneider that he was forced to leave his professorship in Bonn. He then went across the border to revolutionary France in Strasbourg. He was the first to translate the Marseillaise, which later became the uh, French uh, national anthem into German for the largely German speaking Al Alsatian audience. Uh, 
He helped overthrow the mayor, rose in the hierarchy of revolutionary France, became a, a judge in that regime. He um, authorized the execution of at least 30 opponents at Strasbourg of the revolution. But then when the um, uh, Robespierre um, regime uh, turned against some figures it had formerly regarded as supporters, Schneider himself was beheaded. And uh, so this is just one illustration of how the lives and careers of people around Beethoven stood on a knife's edge. And Beethoven was well aware of this when he, when he left the Rhineland, um, first to receive a kind of fellowship for a limited period, then with the French occupation of the Rhineland, the conditions that had nourished him as court musicians uh, no longer existed, so he remained in Vienna, but he dallied with the idea of possibly relocating to Paris in later years, which is one indication of his lasting um, kind of sympathies for the principles, if not the reality of the French Revolution. And speaking of which, and if we're talking about influential people uh, on Beethoven's politics, it's impossible not to talk about Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, of course, most famously associated with Beethoven's Eroica Symphony. Um, but could you tell us uh, your take on, on Beethoven and Napoleon and this relationship? Uh, yeah, I think it's, again, a very fascinating story. Uh, some of the elements that are best known are maybe embodied in the famous uh, opening page of the copy of orchestral parts held in Vienna uh, with uh, Beethoven's uh, elimination of the titling or dedication of the symphony. Uh, I, I'm assuming th this is so famous that virtually everybody is aware of this. In Titolita Bonaparte, you can see the TTE at the end uh, is uh, still readable. Then 804, 1804, Louis, he uses the French form of his first name, um, and he's erased this, although underneath it says Geschrieben auf Bonaparte in pencil, so that alone also indicates a certain ambivalence on Beethoven's part. Now let's look back for a moment at this context. Uh, some aspects of this, I think, uh, are interesting but little known. For instance, uh, it's not well known that the famous hero of the American Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette, um, was in Austrian prison in the course of the 1790s. And I think it's relevant to Beethoven's attraction to Bonaparte. This is the situation. The Marquis de Lafayette, who had become closely associated and a good friend of George Washington, had helped the Americans win the Revolutionary War against the British. He returned to France. He tried in the 1790s to take a middle path between the more radical revolutionaries and the one sympathetic to the royal uh, cause. Uh, because of course the king was not executed for a while. It was in limbo. Um, it wasn't until 1793 that the, the king and Marie Antoinette uh, uh, meet the guillotine. So then after that, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette realizes that the situation for him is too precarious. And so he leaves France, fearing that he might have met the same fate as Eulogius Schneider, and gives himself up to the Prussians and Austrians. However, they do not trust him because he was associated with the revolutionary regime. And so the Austrians throw him into prison at Olmutz, the very town where many years later, the Archbishop Rudolf, Beethoven's um, uh, important contact in the royal family was uh, elevated to Archbishop. Well, um, for several years, the Marquis de Lafayette languishes in prison and even George Washington writing to the Kaiser Franz is unable to uh, obtain its re his release. So what happens? Um, a partial alleviation comes uh, 
when um, Lafayette's wife and daughters are able to get access to the prison and actually live there with him, this staves off his impending death. And then who liberates him but Napoleon? In 1797, uh, in the wake of his uh, victorious uh, campaign in northern Italy, putting the Austrians on the defensive, and the Austrians have to sue for peace, and Napoleon makes it an explicit condition that the Marquis be liberated. And so I suspect that this is one ingredient among others in Beethoven's attraction to a theme like the... uh, um, uh, Leonora opera, which had been produced at Paris in 1798 with this kind of theme. And it also reinforced the idea that Napoleon Bonaparte, when he was first consul up to the period of 1799, 1800 or so, was a very progressive, hopefully a, a political figure of importance who would remain a progressive figure. And it's in this context that that Beethoven um, uh, sees Napoleon positively, that he associates with Bernadotte, the the, um, um, general under Napoleon, who was actually related by family to Napoleon, but turned against Napoleon in later times. And it's this uh, very strong kind of Francophile side to Beethoven that he had to keep under control because he couldn't openly support Napoleon without risking his own security and his own career. Wonderful. And you actually make a slightly tangential Napoleon connection with that um, wonderful portrait that's on the front cover of your book um, by Mailer from 1804. There's all kinds of allegorical and symbolic things in this portrait. Could you talk to us about some of these? Yes, I think that this is, now this is a well-known image of Beethoven, and it's one that I had known for many years. Uh, Everyone who is acquainted with Beethoven biography has seen it. But um, especially in the period I spent in Vienna in 2016 to 17, when I was also co-curator of the New Beethoven Museum, where the portrait and another by Mailer hang, that I began to recognize much more than uh, I had previously in this portrait. I would also credit um, uh, John Club as um, a scholar who has insightfully um, commented on the uh, the portrait, um, and I've tried to extend certain of his insights in this regard. So when we look at Beethoven in this this situation, we can see that Mailer, who um, was also from the Rhineland, grew up in the very locality uh, where Beethoven's mother was from, close to Koblenz. Uh, But Mailer had studied then in Dresden under a well-known portrait painter. He was familiar with the models from antiquity. He was familiar with traditions of landscape and occupational uh, symbolic painting. And so here we have Beethoven in his left hand, a lyre-like instrument, and he holds his right hand, the right hand of the master virtuoso. He looks directly at us with a thoughtful countenance. And as Mailer, who was interviewed by by the Beethoven biographer Thayer decades later, he lived a long life. Uh, As Mailer explained it, he wanted Beethoven to be depicted here as quasi conducting or thinking of music also moving in relation to music. So you have the hand of the master pianist quasi conducting or reflecting on sound and holding an instrument in his left hand. And what is he pointing to? A temple of Apollo. In other words, it's the pose of Orpheus slash Apollo. And uh, at his back is a gnarled old tree. And behind his um, right hand, a pair of vigorous uh, conifer trees in the clearing representing 
the future, the progressive area, um, as opposed to the past, in other words, the dying tree in the dark forest. And it's the left side of the painting where he's pointing or moving that is lit. And um, Beethoven's haircut is significant, as Club has also pointed out before me, um, because it's, uh, it's a haircut a la Titus or a la Titus, uh, explicitly connected to events of in the wake of the French Revolution, when um, men of revolutionary um, persuasion and women too cut their hair short in this kind of choppy style that imitates Roman, um, uh, the period of the Roman Republic, which was in vogue in revolutionary France. And um, so here we've we have also got here the, the the presence of those two trees and the old tree. Tree symbolism was a big deal, and it apparently goes back, as far as I've been able to trace it, to Boston, of all places, in the 1760s, uh, when after the Stamp Act, the American revolutionaries opposed the British and always met, uh, following old precedent, at a grand old elm tree, which the British then cut down, whereupon in all of the colonies in, in the revolutionary period, they had, uh, they had freedom trees. Well, the vogue of freedom trees goes to France and there are another image that we can show, um, if Sam can find it, shows uh, the raising by the French of a freedom tree in Bonn, as they did in many places, uh, this is right around the corner from Beethoven's birthplace. And you can see the French soldiers in October 1794 and the less than enthusiastic Bonn populace observing this as they have raised the French colors and declared the German-speaking Rhineland liberated. So in other words, it's, it's a symbol of liberation. And if we move back to the Mailer portrait for a moment, you can imagine there are two conspicuous trees, young ones, with the dying tree. The dying tree is presumably standing for the Ancien regime, the old regime to be superseded. The two young, vigorous trees, uh, judging by Beethoven's uh, correspondence with painters, he was friendly with more than one painter. It probably stands for an alliance of the arts, the visual arts and music in which um, artists are striving for the progressive causes. They're striving for a kind of uh, claim to immortality at the same time. And uh, among the many other things, if you go to Vienna and look at the original painting, there's something here that you'll see that is more striking than even on this fairly good uh, digital reproduction. And that is at Beethoven's back, the little, um, dash of red. And that is very, very striking in the original painting, if you look at it. And, and it's inexplicable, because there is insufficient light for it to be so bright. And, and uh, John Club has suggested that this may really uh, be the spark that could ignite and maybe burn up the old tree representing the past. In other words, a very carefully planted um, gesture toward that can be recognized as something progressive, but even revolutionary. And in that vein, maybe the, the blue in Beethoven's uh, uh, attire with the white, and then even the suggestion of red, of course, is the, uh, the tricolor, um, which also would be a hidden image. Now, uh, bearing in mind there are no banners on those trees. This is not, so to speak, an overt um, political painting such as you'd find in France in the uh, first half of the 1790s. But it's from 1804, from a, a, a period when the a famous traveler Soima declared that he uh, was able to arouse consternation in a Viennese coffee house just by whistling the Marseillaise. Um, in other words, you had to be careful 
And Beethoven became a master, I think, at planting clues, incorporating allusions, stirring passions, but it was a fine art. To become too overt was not really the best thing. And yet, I think when you when you uh, reflect on Beethoven's opera Fidelio, when you reflect on the the narrative of his fifth symphony and the ninth, one sees that that balancing act is something where he succeeded in preserving and projecting uh, progressive causes. And I don't see that Beethoven in later phases of his career collapsed into some kind of reactionary stance at all. I only see that that is observable for one um, particular uh, period uh, around the Congress of Vienna around uh, 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 1813 to 15. Uh, But uh, there were special conditions that applied to that. Yeah, I would like to talk to you um, about some of your musical criticism. The book is very rich in in musical commentary. And as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, there are some overtly political works in Beethoven's output, Fidelio, Egmont. But um, you also bring in some of his instrumental music and offer some political readings of those. Um, For instance, the Tempest Sonata, also the Appassionata and the and the last piano sonata. Could you talk to us about some of your musical insights from this political perspective? Yes, um, thank you. Um, let's turn to the first of those examples, uh, the the sonata in D minor, Opus Thirty One, Number Two, which he writes at Heiligenstadt. It's a very interesting period in eighteen two, uh, on the advice of his doctor Schmidt. Uh, Beethoven decides to go into seclusion for a half year to spare his hearing because he realizes he's losing the ability to hear the higher registers in particular and is getting very worried about this and does not want to admit that his hearing is damaged. So the doctor said, well, why not go to a spa? He chooses an uh, uh, a lesser known spa in a village of 400 souls, now part of the city of Vienna on the north side called Heiligenstadt. And in Heiligenstadt, he's just finished the second symphony and his um, Prometheus ballet music. He starts to get ideas for a number of works, including the Eroica during this period there. And one of the instrumental pieces is the sonata that became known as the Tempest Sonata in D minor. Now in the first movement of the Tempest, um, Beethoven uh, starts with an improvisatory beginning. In other words, a slow gesture coming out of the depths, a rising broken chord, and then juxtaposes that with um, agitated music, um, allegro. And let's hear just the very beginning of this opening in my recent recording. Now, if we interrupt and move to the development, we'll hear how Beethoven um, utilizes this um, searching, mysterious opening um, and how this 
leads to a very consequential event at the beginning of the recapitulation. Namely, it's the following situation, is the Largo is a kind of mysterious reflective state of mind. One wonders, um, I, w I do wonder whether there is something to the um, disputed and admittedly somewhat questionable uh, allusion to Shakespeare's Tempest. Uh, we should not forget, despite uh, Schindler's um, unreliability, because the story stems from him, that Beethoven indeed knew Shakespeare's Tempest extremely well, and on occasion did play with the idea that he um, was a parallel figure to Prospero. Did Beethoven consider that he was a kind of exiled sorcerer at this time in Heiligenstadt? That's maybe hard to say, but it is certainly true that this reflective mysterious motive is then incarnated in the Allegro in a stormy way. I mean, Prospero also, also generates that storm at the beginning of the play. But um, more importantly, in the bigger context is what happens at the recitative, because the power of the music to be suggestive then generates the type of music that is as close as we can get to speech, recitative. And it's remarkable that the first of the recitatives is almost directly foreshadowing the famous recitative 20 years later at the pivotal point in the Ninth Symphony where the baritone interrupts the instrumental music and says, oh, friends, not these tones, let us sing something more joyful. Um, it, that's the other major work in this key of D minor and Kieser like plots for Beethoven. So we see suddenly that here in 182 already, Beethoven has envisioned something of the pivotal moment of using that Schiller text, finally, the one that he thought about for decades, as the basis for the final movement of his final symphony. So let's here, just to the recitative uh, at the beginning of the recapitulation, through the development of the recitative. Thanks, Sam. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we are going to open the floor to questions in just a moment. Um, so if you have questions for Professor Kinderman, please drop them into the chat and I'll uh, moderate them. And um, before we do that, Bill, I'd like to ask you just to comment on the lasting political influence of Beethoven's music. This is something that you especially cover in the final chapter of your book. Yes, uh, in the final chapter, I devoted attention to actually two aspects. Um, one centered on Beethoven's actual composition of the Ninth Symphony and one on the recent reception history. Um, in the first case, I wanted to point out that Beethoven himself is reported to have had doubts about the choral finale, um, the setting of Schiller that is so famous, so iconic for us. Um, and uh, this is not just an anecdotal report, it's, it's supported by the um, musical manuscripts in which we can see that he repeatedly sketched an alternative to the Schiller um, setting and that the material for this uh, was incorporated into his quartet in A minor opus 132 in which the finale is preceded by a recitative and the um, main theme envisioned as a possible instrumental finale theme in the Ninth Symphony was used uh, in the last movement of the quartet. And in other words, that Beethoven had long before Thomas Mann's uh, Adrian Leverkuhn and Dr. Faustus thought about revoking the ninth uh, with its utopian kind of message, Beethoven himself had viewed this material, this gambit somewhat skeptically, but nevertheless put it forth. And then looking at events um, up to the present day, even between the appearance of this book in its German language version last June and the uh, extra months I had to make touch-ups in the uh, University of Chicago edition, I kept seeing how significant the Ninth Symphony remains globally. Uh, during the pandemic, the Ninth Symphony erupted in various forms as a positive symbol uh, looking back further, uh, it's not just uh, the Bernstein performance with the fall of the Berlin Wall that was a marker in 1989, but the student protests that used it in Beijing in June of that same year. The events even last fall in Chile, where the Ninth Symphony performed uh, at at this main square of the city accompanied uh, progressive uh, calls for democratic reforms. Um, everywhere you look on practically every continent, the Ninth Symphony is used in this way. And uh, I just find it quite remarkable. Many of you might be aware if we just pull up an image of uh, one of the uh, typical performances in Japan with 10,000 participants, uh, if um, Sam could remind us of that image. Yeah, there we have. Now this raises some other issues too, including the issue of conformism, but it reminds us of the, um, the massive scale at which the Ninth Symphony has been incorporated in some parts of the world, notably in Japan and in uh, in Taiwan as well. And then as a final kind of um, gesture or image in this, and I used it as the final image in my book, if we could just show the, uh, the monument at Bonn in 1945. This really caught my attention. The photograph was taken in the spring of 1945 by an American photographer traveling with the Allied armies. And there you see the famous statue from 1845 erected by a fellowship of musicians headed by Franz Liszt. And this is though um, the um, striking image of the legacy of Beethoven standing intact amid the ruins of war uh, exactly a century later. And after other 
uh, striking events had happened, including the role of the motive from the beginning of the Fifth Symphony, which became associated so closely with the Allied uh, resistance to fascism. And Sam, I don't know whether you could quickly, yeah, there we have it. There you have the Allied nations with the V and the da ba ba bum motive, which, uh, as you may know, this was connected to the uh, Morse code pattern of three shorts and a long. In other words, it's a kind of historical coincidence, but the fact that Beethoven's symphony was so associated so strongly with resistance to uh, autocratic or fascist or totalitarian rule, uh, and then uh, stood there amid the ruins of war exactly a century later after the monument was built. All of these threads seemed to come together, which led me to include that as the, uh, the final illustration in a narrative that is ongoing, because the use of Beethoven's music, and especially the ninth, um, is not something that's going to stop anytime soon. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to questions, and we already have some questions in the chat. So I'm going to start with a question from Sergei Kasimov. Um, was Beethoven able to speak French well enough to discuss political and philosophical topics with foreign aristocrats? For instance, did Count Razumovsky speak German well? And which of the aristocrat friends of Beethoven were more sympathetic with his ideals? Um. Beethoven spoke a rough but fluent French. Um, this seems to have uh, been associated with his upbringing. Um, French was a language of considerable currency back in the 18th century. Um, Beethoven, on the other hand, uh, knew almost no English and any communication in English he needed to have a translator, but for very basic rough French he could manage. And let me see, as far as, yes, uh, the um, interaction that Beethoven had with uh, various folks who uh, see, was did the question ask especially about aristocrats or about uh, uh, contacts in general? Um, um, I, I think so. Which of which of Beethoven's aristocratic friends uh, identified with his ideals? Um, some of them did, and some of them didn't. And I think that Beethoven had to be careful about his choice of uh, topic with some of them. I, I have the impression that Lobkowitz, for example, was sympathetic. Um, I'm not uh, certain to what extent with the Archduke, he could be completely frank on this score because he would have had to have been very, very careful with this topic with members of the royal family. His most important aristocratic sponsor in, in his first periods in Vienna was Lishnowski. And, and with Lishnowski, there is a particularly striking tale about which I was able to do fresh research. And, um, and um, so this, this Lishnowski tale is as follows. It's, it's mentioned in all the Beethoven biographies, but, uh, but I've offered some, some, uh, some new material here. It's in 1806 that Beethoven is invited to Greitz, which is a, uh, the land holding uh, kind of center for the Lishnowski legacy, uh, the, the super rich kind of 1% folks. Back in the 18th century, their uh, riches were based largely in land holdings. Uh, and they had many kind of feudal style people working on the land holdings. Lishnowski's land holdings were especially concentrated in the area where Bohemia or the Czech Republic meets Poland, but on the Austrian side of that border. On the other side was the Prussian border. Well, what happens in 1806, Napoleon's expansion. He travels north from Bavaria 
and there is a conflict between the Saxons and the Prussians. He moves through Franconia as so often he outsmarts the, the, uh, the allied generals and deals them a catastrophic defeat at Auerstedt and Jena, whereupon suddenly Napoleon is master of Central and Northern Europe. The road to Berlin is wide open and the road east is wide open. That happens on the 14th of October. Beethoven is then at Greats with Lishnowski. What happens? The French fan out. There are French officers who show up, and this can now be dated by to around the 30th of October. Um, and it has to do with the, uh, what I discovered is that the diary of uh, the poet Eichendorf one of the most famous romantic poets and therefore well-documented in sources, he happened to make a journey from his family's estate, now in Poland, down to Tropau, which was the closest town to uh, Greats. And so he reports as an 18 year old, he was there and that like a lightning bolt, the French victory um, uh, spread through the land and, and the French traveling north to the university town of Halle were told by the director of the, the rector of the university, well, that the rector could not guarantee the response of the German students in Halle, whereupon the French closed the university outright. The, uh, uh, the politics of expansion are really quite strong from the French side. And this results in a rising Francophobia among the German population, some of whom had until this time welcomed the liberation that the French had brought, just as had happened in Italy. So what happens? The French officers there, Lishnowski is worried about his property holdings. He, uh, Beethoven is famous. He tries to convince Beethoven to play for the French officers. He wants him to be, to repay the generous patronage. Beethoven refuses. He refuses again. They almost come to blows. Beethoven leaves in a huff, in a rainstorm. His manuscripts, including the Appassionata, stained then by water, goes back to Vienna and smashes his little statuette of Lishnowski. And that, that illustrates, I think, the kind of political tensions that erupted and that were probably the entire time there lurking. Um, actually, some of them are conveyed with some accuracy, I think, in the uh, BBC film from years back that John Elliott Gardner was involved with, Eroica, uh, where the first rehearsal from June 1804 is enacted. And one can look back at that. It's really true. This was a, a, a really balancing act, an explosive situation. Beethoven was at real risk in some of these situations. And you can see that with Lishnowski, he was willing to, to experience a break and a cessation of support from his most important single sponsor because of his political convictions, which then had turned against the French. I mean, a few years, a couple of years before he was still playing with going to Paris. In 1806, he's willing to break with Lesnowski over not playing for the French officers because they now represent an oppressive force. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Stefan Frazier. Do we know about Beethoven's uh, about uh, about Beethoven's feelings regarding America and especially slavery? Um, I wish we knew more about that. Uh, one suspects, or I suspect, uh, his sympathies here and there. There are certain references to America that are sympathetic. There's one in the conversation notebooks I remember from the 1820s in a conversation with his nephew Carl, where the gist of it is that to obtain freedom, one has to go to America. Um, and the, um, the issue concerning slavery, um, I think there are indications uh, in the direction of the Marquis de Lafayette, as I mentioned, or a figure like Alexander von Humboldt. Um, 
that one imagines that Beethoven would not have been sympathetic to slavery uh, because um, he would have seen the principles of the French Revolution as not being narrowly prescribed on racial grounds. But admittedly here, there is a bit of a lack of evidence. I don't want to make claims that go too far beyond the evidence. Uh, when Beethoven himself was involved with people who were biracial, um, he seems to have had a grand time. Uh, and um, um, But with the typical conflicts between individuals that were always characteristic, one thinks uh, for example, um, his friend, who was then no longer a friend, Bridge Tower, who was um, a, um, so to speak, in the uh, parlance of those terms, of mixed race. Uh, his mother was uh, European Caucasian. His father was um, Negroid uh, and from the West Indies. And uh, Bridge Tower, a distinguished and passionate violinist who had spent time in, in, in England, he goes to Vienna, he uh, meets Beethoven, the two have a grand time, they have a performance at a breakfast concert with the premiere of the Kreutzer Sonata, Beethoven reportedly embraces during the performance Bridge Tower when Bridge Tower was so audacious as to improvise a little cadenza passage in the first movement. But then later they have a break apparently over a girl and therefore bridge tower fails to get the um uh, the dedication to the kreutzer sonata which he really deserved and kreutzer got it because he had come with the french group under bernadette uh, who was connected to napoleon had had briefly been ambassador to austria in the, around 1799 uh, so Bridge Tower loses out and, and the Francophone uh, interests win out, but uh, no evidence that Beethoven had any high kind of prejudice against people of other races. And I don't imagine that was the case, but I, I think a lack of evidence uh, uh, prevents us from being maybe too, too uh, strong on that point. Um, there is a question submitted in, in advance from uh, Francis in Kelsale in Suffolk. It's a multi-part question, but I'm going to um, <clears throat> pick out one question, which is how did Beethoven and his colleagues, did they discuss their political views openly? How did people talk about politics in, uh, in this kind of uh, revolutionary time that Beethoven lived through? I think that, um, that I suspect that there was among people of similar conviction, very open discussions. And uh, I think evidence for this comes even from the circle around Mailer and Beethoven's friend uh, von Breuning, who introduced Mailer to Beethoven. Uh, these were all, uh, this was a group of Rhinelander. You know, have to have to realize that even though the, the German language was the language Beethoven could use in Vienna, he was a foreigner there. He was from the Rhineland. He hung out with Rhinelander and uh, generally said in a couple a couple letters that he thought that his best friendships were with people from his kind of home region, that he had a certain lingering mistrust of the Viennese. This is a kind of light motive in some of the, the papers. And uh, von Breuning, for instance, um, uh, he goes to Vienna because he's afraid as a doctor who had exercised caution about the spread of disease in the time of the French military occupation of Bonn, that uh, this was gotten wind of in a French paper who accused him of being anti-French. And in the period of, uh, of Robespierre, he was afraid for his own neck and therefore fled to, to uh, Vienna. I think you can assume that in those circles that people talked very frankly, and this is reflected in the um, 
private documents from Beethoven's later years, like the conversation notebooks, of course, which were private and not accessible. Um, and in the conversation notebooks, one, there are references there to spies and not speaking too loud in public places like pubs. Uh, and there are references to extremely derogatory comments about the Emperor Franz. And other people got in trouble by speaking the way Beethoven did. Beethoven got by because he was in, regarded as a famous and eccentric uh, artist. Um, but there's no doubt uh, Beethoven uh, confessed on his bedhead, uh, on his deathbed about Napoleon in one source that yes, he had been wrong about Napoleon, refers to Napoleon as the equivalent of a shithead. And, and language like that surfaces now and then with the emperor. And that's the kind of thing you could say in a private setting, uh, but you could not say uh, with impunity just out on the open street uh, without there being repercussions. Thanks. We didn't need to wrap up, but on the, on the topic of what you were just saying, we did have a question from Linda Crystal, which was, how did he manage not to be arrested, Beethoven, um, by Metternich and Metternich's agents? And then a follow-up comment from Mark Zimmer, commenting that in one of the conversation books, Franz Oliva writes that they were followed home from the tavern by Metternich's secret police. I wonder if you have anything to add to that. Yes, and there is a, uh, as some of you might know, there is a police file on Beethoven from the period of the Congress of Vienna, uh, where one of Metternich's people reported on Beethoven and, and interestingly enough said that there, there was a, a group of pro, um, a fans of Beethoven and a larger group who didn't want to hear anything about Beethoven. They identify Beethoven falsely as Ludwig von Beethoven. I wonder whether that even played positively into the report. It was wrong because they must have been under the impression he was a, a he was an aristocrat. He was not. At the court hearings over the custody of his nephew, he was once forced to to uh, ask to produce um, a, a pedigree of aristocratic status, and he didn't have it. And it's it's very true. There are these references to the uh, to the spies and to the risk of being politically blunt. And people, Beethoven is a deaf person. Deaf people tend to talk loudly. And there are also references a couple times in in taverns that he's talking too loud. That so and so, a spy is over there. Don't talk loudly. Um, but um, Beethoven. The only time I'm aware that he was arrested was for a different reason. He was in one of his uh, summer haunts, went on a long, long hike, lost his way and was peering in the windows of, of dwellings where he was not known and he looked like a tramp. And there they actually hauled him in, in Wiener Neustadt as a bum, as a tr street person. And then he claimed, no, I'm Beethoven. They knew who Beethoven was, didn't believe it. But then finally he, he convinced the police to contact a local musician who, who vouched for him. <laughs> no, he, he got by without being arrested. But one, I could very well imagine that he might have. And by the way, there are other sources. One that I cite is from uh, Joseph Gelenik. Gelenik was a well-known composer and pianist on the Viennese scene who also worked for aristocrats. And he was well-known for writing untold, um, but rather facile uh, variation pieces. Well, Gelenik had a falling out with Beethoven in earlier years, and he had a grudge with Beethoven because he had been shown up in a piano playing competition uh, many years before. Well, there's one source from 18, around 1820, where the report is, yeah, Gelenik was complaining about you at the Kamel, uh, the, the pub, some Schwarzen Kamel still exists in Vienna's first district, by the way. And that Gelenik said that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Beethoven griped about the emperor. He griped about the archduke. He griped about this person and that person and that he would end up on the gallows. And of course, that's 
that would have replicated the situation way back for someone like Eulogia Schneider or other progressives in the purge of 1794, when there is a coded reference to Beethoven who writes to his friend Simrock, a musician who became a, a wealthy publisher and who was a francophone in Bonn. And he puts this reference in the middle of a letter, sort of in a coded spot. And he says, they're clamping down here, they're arresting people. They, they, the uh, police have loaded guns. They lock these, the gates to the inner city at 10 o'clock each night. You can't speak too loudly or you can be arrested. All of these things are in there in the uh, context of the arrest and the show trials that led to political progressives or more radical kind of communist type um, agitators who had been more tolerated under the earlier regime, but not under the clampdown under Kaiser Franz uh, by 1794. And one of these people, as I outlined, his name was Habenstreit. He was executed and as I traced it, his, his decapitated head was on display in the Vienna Criminal Museum until 2012 as an enemy of the state. And only in response to recent protests did they take it down. So that shows you the lasting legacy uh, that you still have traces of in Vienna. You now have traces of it. One of the finest pastries you can get in the fine pastry shops in Vienna is known as the Kremschnitte. Well, it's the uh, Austrian variant of what is known in France as a Napoleon. And, you, and if you find these kind of pastries here, but they won't be as good as in Vienna, um, they'll also possibly be called a Napoleon. In Austria, to this day, they will never call them a Napoleon because of the background of Austria being an occupied client state under Napoleon's domination. Wow, even pastries are political. <laughs> That's wonderful. We do need to wrap up. I do feel like we could talk for another hour. This is such a rich topic. Thank you so much for the insights that you've given us today from your book. Um, it is available from the University of Chicago Press. Um, so I do recommend that people, um, people read it. Bill, thank you so much for a really rich and fascinating conversation today. Thank you, Erica. And thanks to all of you who tuned in and uh, do support the uh, San Jose Beethoven Center and the American Beethoven Society. Uh, it's a wonderful program. Thank you so much, Bill. Okay, take care, everybody. And I hope to see you again at another event soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.